the very first Arrowhead Innovation Network workshop. Bobby K. Nelson, a CPA out of Albuquerque, has graciously offered to be our first speaker in the series, and she is also an enterprise advisor here with Arrowhead. Short and sweet. Well, and I think if you were just talking, I think I've been an advisor here for about three years now. And I think that the number one question that is always universally asked is, what kind of entity should I be? Um, and that's a great question, um, but there's also other things to keep in mind, which is kind of what we're going to be talking about today. So the, the four things that I wanted to touch on is entity selection and registration requirements. What does that mean? Um, accounting best practices and tax best practices. These are two different things. So, um, under entity selection, um, you know, rule of thumb for lots of folks is I'm going to be an LLC. It's easy to register, it's easy to set up, everybody likes it, everybody knows what it is, blah, blah, blah. Um, it may not be the best bet for you. And one of the things that I don't hear folks talk about a lot is the type of owner that some, you know, somebody says, I want to you know, partner with you, or I want to invest in your, your company. And it's one person. But maybe that one person has his own LLC. And maybe it's the LLC that wants to invest. And so it, you need to consider, is that the best structure for what I'm looking for? And I, one of the handouts that we have is, I think it's four or five pages of things to consider about entity selection, what's good, what's bad uh, for each category. There's a ton of categories there. Um, and hopefully this is something that everybody will look at when they're trying to figure out, is this the right thing? Um, one of the other ideas and items you really need to think about is, how do I get my money? How do I get the equity out of the, out of the business? How do, how do I get it out, and what are my options? You know, do I want to take draws and not worry about it? Uh, one of the items I did put on here was loans. Do I want the company to loan me money for my living expenses or to pay my investor back? How are we going to do that? Um, do I want W-2 wages? Is that something that's important to me, that I have an actual W-2 wages? And if so, what kind of entity should I set up? Because you don't want to set up a partnership if you want to get W-2 wages. And the reason is you can't have and the, the owner in a partnership, the partner in a partnership can't get a W-2. And sometimes you'll you'll see, I see it more often now with the, with the advent of LLCs because um, people don't view, some people don't view LLC law to mean that it's a partnership that really technically for legal purposes is not a partnership. So some folks will tell you that you can't have W-2 wages under an LLC. Um, there could be situations, um, and when I say situations, I'm talking about if you ever get audited, where somebody will say, oh no, you're a partnership, you can't have W-2 wages. So that means that we need to, to figure out all your payroll tax liabilities. So it's just something to consider and give some good thought to. Um, I, I hear all the time about uh, it's easy to set up an LLC. Yeah, it is. But what about when you want to close it? How do you go about closing it? What are the steps that you need to think about when you're closing an entity? Um, one of the items that I see folks forget or purposely decide not to do is to deregister with all the different localities or the IRS or whoever, I see lots of people forget to do that. And if you forget or you choose not to because, you know, I'm not doing it anymore, so it doesn't matter. I don't have any income. I haven't been doing this business for a while. If you don't formally close it out, they don't view you as formally closed out. And so you still have, in some cases, filing requirements. Um, and then there's penalties if you haven't filed and you have filing requirements. So those are important things to think about is closing out your business. Because I know here at Arrowhead, um, there's lots of entrepreneurs and people with great ideas. And some of those ideas are wonderful and they take off and they make you money and you can sell them and you know, great, great stuff. And others, 
while it may be a good idea, whatever the factors and the universe coincide, it's not perfect for you. And the business just really doesn't take off the ground or you don't have time to invest thoroughly in it. And so you've set it up, you've got your LLC there. What are you going to do with it? And you know, you can't, if, if you set up an LLC and you have an intention to do a certain, you know, I'm going to do this web based business where I, you know, I uh, design an app and they get it and they whatever. Um, and then you decide it doesn't work. Um, but one of the things you need to think about before you decide, I'm going to go through the whole closing process, is, is there a possibility that I may use this LLC again in the future? Um, if you're going to do that, that's a good idea. That way you don't have to go through the cost again. You've left it, you, your registration's generic enough that you can put something in its place. Um, but you do need to remember, remember if you have filing requirements. And, uh, that way you don't get into a penalty situation where um, it can cost you a lot of money. Um, record keeping. Record keeping is so important. You know, whether you, you have a paperless system, whether you have a shoebox full of stuff, it doesn't, you just need to keep your stuff. And uh, if you're not somebody who's organized, that's fine. Uh, find a friend, find somebody that's organized Somebody that likes to put things in piles. I don't know if y'all are a fan of Big Bang Theory, but um, you know the the episode where Sheldon goes into Wallowitz's closet and does his thing makes it all pretty. You know, all of us have a friend or a family member that's like that. Get them to help you. Um, it's so important, not just for you know annual tax returns, but just to make sure that you're able to find your records when you need them. You never know what's going to happen. I just got word just a few minutes ago. I've been working on a, a case for a client, and uh, she 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 got married. She used to work in Chicago for um, a company that was purchased by IBM. So she did all this international stuff, and she got married. And her husband was going to be a professor of nuclear engineering at UNL. So she gives up her career and she moves out here to New Mexico. And this was back in 2009, no wait, 2008. And IBM told her, you know what? Um, what if we'll put you on a consulting contract till you figure out what you're going to do. So she did that, and she, you know, she filed her stuff, and she yeah, thought she was doing the right thing, found a CPA, and all this stuff. And then she got another job. It took her nine months. She only did this consulting for nine months, and then she got a job. And she forgot all about it until Tax and Rev came and found her and said, oh, guess what? In 2010 and 2011, you have matching notices. Your, your, um, in fact, that's her calling you right now. She's so excited. <laughs> <laughs> um, so she, you know, the, what the state will do is say, your Schedule C doesn't match what your CRS1s are. So we're going to audit you. Yay! And, you know, a lot of times people think, oh, I can just deal with this myself. I'll call them up and explain them what the situation is. No, don't ever do that. That doesn't work at all. Um, and so so this, this gal, she ended up having, because she was a consultant for a big multinational corporation and she did most of her work outside it wasn't just outside New Mexico it was outside the United States um, she had to pull emails and contracts and invoices and stuff from 2010 and so luckily she I mean she had a apparently her hard drive crashed and so she had she ended up having to take her computer and get it all figured out but the point is, record creep keeping is vital. You all really need to remember that. You never know what's going to happen to you. And just remember, for a lot of taxing authorities, they can go back uh, seven years. And if you've been a non-filer, they can go back to the inception of when you started your business. Uh, even if you haven't been doing your business, but you just never closed it out. Um, they can go back a long ways. So, Record keeping is so, so very important. <clears throat> um, and, oh, leadership and owner roles in a business. Um, it's not always a good idea.
idea to form a business with your family member or with your best buddy. <laughs> uh, because you really need to consider the fact that, that who's going to be the boss? Oh, we're both going to be the boss. Well, it doesn't always work out that way. Because somebody needs to sign stuff, so somebody's going to be the signator or own stuff. And that person may end up thinking, boss. Or, anyway, consider leadership roles very carefully. If one person has a, a greater affinity for numbers, well, maybe that person should be the administrative leader, and the other person really has the, the vision and you know doesn't know where the car keys are half the time. But you know they have these great ideas. That person is your creative director or whatever you're going to call it. But that's how you should choose. And just remember that having a legal agreement that delineates any potential conflict you may have is so important. Uh, in other words, don't just grab one of those three pagers off the internet or from a state uh, secretary of state site that says, oh, here, just fill this out, this is your agreement. Mm, yeah, that's not going to cover you should you and your partner, business partner, who's been your best friend since you were six years old. Oh, we've been best friends. That makes it the worst case. And you really want to make sure that that way you don't have to argue, you don't need to fight, you don't, sometimes you won't even need to bring attorneys in because you have it delineated. What's going to happen to what? I mean, it's just like getting married. It's easy to get married, it's a pain in the rear end to get out of it. Um, it's expensive, it's time consuming, it's heartbreaking. A business is exactly like a marriage. So just remember that if you cover all your bases at the front end, and think through things, don't rush. Oh, I'm in a hurry, my idea is so cool. If I don't get it to market right away, I'm in, somebody's gonna beat beat me to it and then, and then I'm gonna lose out. Well, yes, that is one consideration, but you gotta get all your ducks in a row. It is so important to think through some of these things. Uh, last item here was transferability of ownership interests. And that means, okay, I've got an LLC and I've decided to report it for tax purposes as a partnership. So now you've got two things. You've got, for, for legality purposes, you have, an L, you have a membership interest. And that's what the equity is. And then for tax purposes, you've got a partnership. And so you have to deal with all the, um, all the uh, Code Section K regulations, which are really horrible. Um, so you've got all those things to think about. So you find somebody that um, wants to invest $100,000 in your business. And then two years down that line, he says, you know what, you're doing okay, I want my money back. Uh, or, um, you know what, I gave you that money, but you know what, my brother, I'm gonna transfer it to him because he's really interested in it and I really don't wanna be involved in this. So consider, how your transferability of the interest is going to take place. And how am I going to tax that, that transaction when it comes out the other end? What is the tax ramifications going to be? Is it going to hit my business or is it going to hit that person? Uh, do I want it to hit that person? Because that person has been really good to me. Do I want them to have a big, huge tax burden at the end of the day? So all those things need to be considered because there are lots of ways to skin a cat as long as you've thought it through. So that's really important, just think things through. Um, there's always a consequence to it. Okay. Registrations. Okay, how many of you, where I've got over here, um, doing business in quotes. How many of you know why I have that there? Um, all the states in the United States have really, you know, decided that's a great term, doing business. What does it mean to be doing business in my state? Well, for Secretary of State purposes, it could mean one thing. And to the Department of Revenue, the taxing authority, doing business could be something else. But it could also, it could be something else for sales and use tax purposes. And doing business could be something else for income tax purposes. So in a state, you could have three different definitions of what is doing business. So I, I have another client that um, he sells um, fitness equipment um, online. And so 
So he has a warehouse, we get shipped out, and initially he used eBay and Amazon and all that stuff. And now he, you know, his business has really grown. But um, he didn't, he had heard something about California being a little difficult. And so he calls and he says, you know, I've been doing a lot of business in California lately. Is there something I should think about? And he says, well, what is it, what do you mean by doing business? And so he described to me that, you know, he sits, he used to, well, he moved into an office this year, but he used to sit in his house and, you know, he'd take orders and get them processed and he was in Portland, Oregon. Take these orders in Portland, get them processed, get them fulfilled, and people in California got their sporting equipment. Yay. Well, you have to figure out, what does California think about that? Well, California decides under their doing business rules that for Secretary of State purposes, he's doing business. So he needs to be registered there. And for um, Franchise Tax Board, and in California you have your Franchise Tax Board, which does income tax, and then you have your Board of Equalization, which does sales and use of property tax. So different, different locations, different personnel, different leadership. So Franchise Tax Board says, guess what? You're doing business in California. And so, you know, you've been here for a while, so you need to, you know, divvy up all these, these tax returns, and you owe money. So we took care of that, and then we looked at sales and use tax. Guess what? He's not doing business in California for purposes of sales and use. So you really have, kind of have to look through these things and uh, figure out, you have to read through the definition, and sometimes you're going to have to read through it 15 times to figure out what the heck they're talking about. Um, am I doing business? And so do I have a registration requirement? The reason why Secretary of State registration is so vital, and lots of people just totally blow it off and forget about it, especially web-based businesses. Because when you're a web-based business, you're sitting in your house and you're just churning or you, know, you share an office with somebody and you're sending stuff and it goes all over the place. I sent it to Sri Lanka, I sent it to Maine. You know, my stuff is everywhere. Well, in some states, because you're sending your stuff to Maine, it may, you may be doing business there for purposes of their Secretary of State uh, laws. And the reason it's important is if something happens, something bad happens, and somebody wants to sue you from that jurisdiction, if you have not registered to do business in that jurisdiction, then legally you have no, no right to be in that jurisdiction. And so you don't have any, any leg to stand on. You're basically you're screwed because you should have registered. So you have no right to have stepped foot in that, in that state or that jurisdiction because you didn't find out whether their rules require you to say, hi, I'm here, I want to obey all your laws. And so that's really important. Just look, everybody's got a Secretary of State website except, for, let's see, it's in Arizona. Arizona calls it the, um, the corporation something or other. Theirs is different. They don't like to be secretaries. Um, but you, you have to find those out, read through the rules, decide if you're going to be doing business, especially if you're a web-based business. Because web-based business, you think you're just here. I'm just here at my computer and I'm taking care of stuff and I'm processing orders and I'm doing stuff. And I never leave this spot. Well, your stuff does. Your, your communications do. <coughs> your deliverable does. Um, you know, maybe you have an independent contractor out there that, um, you know, this person says, you know what, I'm gonna do sales for you. I have a great relationship with school districts all over the country. And so I can sell your product or I can, you know, I'm out there anyway doing X, Y, and Z. And so I can do this for you as well. And uh, so that person says, all you have to do is you give me a commission. Just give me a spiff for everything we sell. Well, when that person steps foot for you, and you know, because they're doing something for you, once that person steps foot there, guess what? You have nexus in that state, so you're doing business. And so you have a whole other realm of, of oh my gosh. Uh, another place, um, trade shows. You go to a trade show, you need to find out what the rules are in that state. Is that it, is the trade show going to cause me problems? Because you know state um, 
employees, like California, they troll those places looking for non-compliance. <laughs> it's really ridiculous and it sounds awful, but it's true. That's what they do. And they like to get you. And they don't care if you don't have to <laughs> You know, it's just it's not an issue to them. So, um, something very important to think about. Um, the exposure and penalties. Not every state has penalties if they find out that you're doing business in their state without, um, without having registered. Except Texas, and you guys are real close to Texas here. Texas is horrible. If you decide, you know, you start your business and it's going good, and you've decided, um, ooh, I forgot to register in Texas, but I, I started my business in January, and it is now October. Oopsies. You register in Texas, which you need to register in Texas, and you say, I started doing work here in Texas in, in January. It's now October. They're going to send you a nice little invoice that says you have penalties. Sorry. And that's just the way it is. Uh, do you need to register? Yeah. Um, sometimes it, if you can figure out a way to fudge that date that is reasonable, you might want to do that if there's going to be huge penalties because Texas is a huge gotcha in that, in that uh, vein. Okay, accounting best practices. Well, we talked about the, the importance of keeping records. And see the, the bottom one down there? It's underlined, bolded with an exclamation point. Um, that's important. You've got to make your finances a priority. And, you know, I know there's lots of people out there that don't like to do that stuff. They don't understand that stuff. It's confusing, it's complicated, and usually when it's something you don't want to do, just don't like it, it makes you uncomfortable, it's pain, it's boring. What do we do? It's not there. I don't have to do it. Or, you know what, I'm just gonna put it off because it's a pain. Well, guess what happens then? You end up like my client that just called me a few minutes ago because she's so excited because we got her out of her mess. Only you don't have the records because you didn't take the time to make them. Um, it's real important. It's also important when you're growing to know what your cash is. Cash is really important. I remember when I first started out um, working in public accounting back in the you know the old ages before we had computers. Literally, um, my my boss told me if your cash doesn't balance, you have a problem. That's what's always important. You've got to remember that your cash is king. You've got to make sure you know what your cash balance is. So that's the number one thing. If you can't do anything else, make sure you're keeping track of your cash. And even if your cash is Bitcoin or whatever it is that's out there in the internet that people use today, you still got to keep track of what, it, what do I have? What do I have that's liquid? Um, your idea? Your great idea, your 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 um, your IP. It's not dollars. It can't pay my utility bill. It can't pay my employee. Um, it can if you if you have a transaction that converts it into those dollars. But if you don't, uh, your idea is just your idea, and it's not going to put food on the table. So it's important to know about your cash. The other thing is, take some time to take a class, uh, go to stuff like this, where they teach you how to read a financial statement. So you're looking at a financial statement. What is it telling me? What is a balance sheet? Why do I care? What is this doing for me? What's the different kinds of income statements? Do I really need cost of goods sold? What is that? I remember it in my business class, but why is it important? Well, it is important. And inventory, if you have inventoryable items, so important, so important, because there's lots of, um, for purposes of fulfillment, fulfilling orders, it's important to know how much I got. Um, if I uh, have a, a business where I create something, and so I have my parts inventory, and then I have my finished goods inventory, if you don't keep track of your inventory, maybe you have 50,000 screws, but you only have 10 washers. How's that going to help? So it's really important to know what do I got? 
Um, what have I been spending my money on? Am I doing that so, uh, am I watching it so that I'm maintaining my cash properly? Um, all those things are important. It's also important for tax purposes because there are a bajillion ways to say that you're, you're accounting for inventory. And then there's tax mechanisms to um, save you money if you want to change your accounting method for inventory valuation. So the uh, inventory is one of, those, one of those items that can be used for tax purposes to shift your income. So something to keep in mind. It's also important for cash control and also for keeping your business going. Um, so reading a general ledger. Um, it's important to know what a general ledger is. Why is that important? Why is it, I, if I've got the financial statements, what do I need the general ledger for? Well, you know, it's a good habit to periodically scan and make sure that somebody's not doing something screwy or somebody's just not stupid and posting things to the wrong places because that ends up costing you in the long run. Um, if you end up having to take your stuff to an accountant because you didn't take the time to understand why your general ledger wasn't balancing or it just looked weird and you couldn't get your cash, guess what? It costs you a lot of money to get that fixed up. And you have to get that fixed up so you can file your income tax return. Or you have to get that fixed up because you have an investor that wants to see financial statements and they want to give you money. So it's important and it can be costly to get somebody else to do it. So it's important just figure out uh, who you can go to that can give you a quick lesson on how to do these things. Um, it's also important to have business partners. Those are the three that we always recommend. Is you've got to find a banker, you've got to find a lawyer, you've got to find an accountant. Um, there's a lot of things that uh, you can find these things online. You can find virtual ones, you can find cheap ones, you can find all those things. It's also good to have a real person that um, you can actually go to and sit down with a bunch of paper or sit down with your with this and go over all your stuff. Um, so consider figuring that out. The other thing is when you're picking these people, make sure that you vetted them. Go and do a Google search. Go to the Better Business Bureau. Make sure that they're kind of kosher. Uh, ask your friends. Ask family members. You know, ask uh, colleagues. Just do a little bit of research before you decide you're going to go with somebody because not all of these folks really know what they're doing. They may, and I, I refer to people, sometimes there's, there's the shiny people. The shiny people, they just, they're excellent. They just look wonderful. And, and if you look at me, you can tell because I have a, you know, I'm, I just, I'm totally great. And I, I know everything. And I'm wonderful. And those are the shiny people. Shiny people don't always know what, they, what they're doing. And they can cause you a whole lot of trouble. So it's important to, to vet those. Uh, really, Google searches are great. You can find out lots of stuff. You can find out, you know, oh, they, they presented a case before uh, the Taxation and Revenue Department, and they lost their shirt because they didn't know what they were doing. Uh, you can find that out by doing a Google search. You can find out all kinds of good stuff. So do that for all these places. Um, if you're going to pick a banker, make sure it's a bank that's going to stay solvent. Make sure it's a <laughs> bank that isn't going to get bought soon. Because if they get bought soon, what happens? Your loan may not be one that they want. And so then they sell it. And then they sell it to somebody that you would have never wanted to do business with in the first place, but you have no choice because they sold it. It doesn't belong to you. So uh, consider those things. Um, tax considerations. I think I've already alluded to the fact that when you're thinking about tax, the most important thing is geographic areas. Okay, it doesn't have any, IRS is one small piece. Just one small piece. The ones that are gonna bankrupt you are all those states. And in the cases of, you know, in Arizona or Colorado, it's the little cities and towns and counties because they all have jurisdictional authority to tax you, assess you, uh, create a lien against 
whatever, and they all have different weird rules. I mean, Colorado has the weirdest compensate on our use tax rules. Um, if you, you, I mean, have, have you guys heard about the, the court case um, that uh, is about color, the state of Colorado is going to require all businesses to send a notice to residents um, letting them know how much stuff they bought online that is subject to use tax. And so there's a court case, and apparently the new Supreme Court justice nominee is the one that wrote the decision on that. Um, so anyway, that one's pending, and that's going to cause some flurry of issues that is probably going to resonate all over the, the U.S. But, um, yeah, you guys need to think about that. California, and the reason I go back to California is because they're the worst. If you're going to do business in California, you really need to do your homework because they're awful. I have another client. The client is um, a manufacturer in Berlin. Family-owned business. They've lived in Berlin. Their family's been in Berlin for you know, generations. So they have this manufacturing business, and they do pretty good. You know, it's family-owned business. And guess what the state of California did? They went and they did Google searches. And they looked for businesses that do business in California. And then they went to their website and they looked at it and they said, oh, oh, look at that, they have this customer that they're highlighted on their website that they've done business in California. Yay. Oh, look, there's a, there, there's a link right there. I could just send them an email. And so the Board of Equalization sent them an email that said, hi, looks like you've been doing business in California. Give us a call and, and by the way, fill out this questionnaire. And thank goodness I had had a talk with my client about if you ever get a hey, how you doing letter, and that's what I refer to those things as, hey, how you doing letters, please call me, don't fill it out. Whatever you do, don't fill that thing out because you're going to shoot yourself in the foot. And so luckily we were able to fill it out. And like my, my client that does fitness equipment, is not doing business in California for purposes of sales and use, which the Board of Equalization um, runs. So we were able to get out of that. But if you know, I hadn't told my client, don't ever do that. Um, no telling what would have happened. But they, you know, info at client.com, and that's how they got them. So you gotta be careful. I, I tell my clients all the time, you're gonna set up a website. Yes, that's a great marketing tool. Awesome. Be careful. You really need to be careful with what you put on there. If you decide that you want to highlight a client or a customer uh, and say where they are, then just know what you're getting yourself into and make sure you've covered your tracks before. So um, what's a marketing gimmick to you guys and a tool to earn revenue is a revenue earner for these states because they you know, they're all like the state of New Mexico. They have budget processes and they're looking for money any way they can find it. And so that's what happens. Um, so I can't see that far. Okay, uh, ooh, a transaction processing program. That is really key. Again, I have, a, I have another client. This client, they sell, they sell, um, they call them modifications to pinball machines. Cool. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, where, they're um, the lab where they create these things are very cool. 3D printers, all this great stuff, right? Their stuff was a mess. It took me forever to get them out of their, their sales and use tax problems. But the good news that came out of that is they found a good transaction partner. A partner that, uh, it's a partner is another company out there that what they do is they help you with your website and when somebody makes an order, they help make sure that um, the sales transaction is processed in the right way. Maybe it's coming from Venezuela. And they make sure that the currency works and all that kind of stuff happens. They make sure the, that it's fulfilled properly and the right kind of shipping happens because you know we can't assume that the same kind of shipping that happens in the US is the same kind of shipping that happens in Saudi Arabia. We don't know, most of us don't. Um, and then the biggie, tax, they take care of that too. And they'll, if you pay them a fee, they'll even take care of the filing requirements for you. 
so you don't have to deal with this. It's really tough. Uh, had an employee, actually I had two employees, that went on to work for the GAP, you know, GAP's corporate um, administrative headquarters are in Albuquerque. And um, so these guys, because uh, they do, they mostly specialized in sales and use tax when they were working in public accounting, so they went on to work at the GAP, filing all of the GAP's many locality and state tax returns. And literally they have three people, but that's what their job is to file multi-state tax returns in Canada. Um, it's a big job, and it can be very um, complicated, uh, it can cause you a lot of problems. So it's great to have a business partner that will help you and do that for you. Again, vet them. Don't get somebody that says they're going to do it for you, but you know they're just starting out. Uh, make sure you, you don't. I mean, unless you really want to, I would suggest being the guinea pig. You know, getting pig isn't always a good idea. Um, other thing to think about. Uh, again, IRS isn't your only um, taxing authority that you need to worry about. You've got sales and use tax. You've got state income and/or franchise tax. Um, we have, we in New Mexico, we have an income tax plus if you're a corporation, you have $50. Um, if you're in California, you have um, your income tax plus the $800, even if you're an LLC, even if you're a single member LLC, you have $800. Bucks. Um, that's the minimum tax. Um, employee withholdings, oh my goodness, employee withholdings. You want to go to jail, don't file, collect. Withholdings and don't send the money in, that's a speedy ticket to jail, literally. Um, you can't, you can't, you're not allowed to keep somebody else's money. Same thing goes for, for sales tax. If you collect sales tax and don't remit it, you know, that's bad. That's very bad and it's going to cost you, well, it costs you freedom because they don't, people don't like that, that you stole, and basically you're stealing money from somebody. Important to keep that in mind. Uh, unemployment taxes, federal and state. You've got your um, your, your sudas and your fidas. You've got to figure all that out. Then there's workers' comp. I have to. Uh, you got to think about that too if you have employees. And then I think the last one I have on there is. Uh, what do I have? Oh, property taxes. Oh, on locality business and property taxes. There's real and personal. So if you're a business, you have to file personal property tax reports. So that means that, um, fortunately, with the, all the federal tax rules, that all the tangible property regulations that went into effect two years ago, um, they came up with those de minimis thresholds so that you don't have to uh, capitalize everything. But anything that you capitalize and you depreciate for federal income tax purposes and you don't take Section 179 on, um, then you you need to file um, a personal property tax report and pay the personal property tax. Even sometimes, even if you're not going to owe anything because you section 179 everything, you may still need to report that so that the taxing jurisdiction knows um, that you're on the up and up. So all these things are important. And now, okay, who's got questions? Yes, sir. So, um, Facebook is a website, you know, it's, it's a web based thing. Mm -hmm. So, they're registered in every state and they're filling taxes in every state? Facebook? Yeah. yeah. Well, they should be. I mean, I don't know what they're doing, but yeah. They because if be. I have a web based business, you know, like uh, I'm going to sell in the website, you know, anyone from the Chicago or anyone from the California might buy it. Mm -hmm. So, does that mean that I, I'm doing business in Chicago and the California? It depends on what the rules are. As, as I said, you have to go in and you have to read they're doing business rules. Almost all states anymore have doing business rules. Um, and that's the new hot thing. And so you have to look at the ones for the Secretary of State, because that's the legal entity requirement. Then you gotta look at the ones for, for sales and use tax. And then you have to look at income tax. Am I doing business for these three purposes? And you have to read their rules and figure out what it is that you're doing, specifically doing, what's your deliverable, and is it an intangible, is it a tangible, is it a service, what am I doing? And for purposes of web type things, 
sometimes um, if somebody can download something from you that you've created. In some states, that's considered an intangible. In some states, it's considered a tangible. Um, in some states, it's considered a service. And so you need to figure out what is it I'm dealing with? What does this state say that I'm dealing with? And so whether it's whether we like it or not, it's the way the world is right now. Um, I think that there is a push because so many people are so frustrated with the way this is working. I think probably in the next five years we're going to have some more uniformity, but it all goes back to the U.S. Constitution. And the problem is um, Congress doesn't want to mess with the U.S. Constitution because then it ends up at the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court's going to have to decide whether they're going to want to deal with uh, messing with the U.S. Constitution because it's the Due Process Clause and the Commerce Clause that deal with having the deal with letting states tax um, how they ever they want to, and so that that's the big issue. Um, maybe if they can, the Senate confirms um, the the guy that's been nominated, the one from Colorado that that did the did the, the thing with the internet taxes and the use taxes, um, maybe they'll deal with it sooner rather than later. So, you know, on the horizon, I do think that that's something that's going to have to be dealt with. There's going to be so many people so upset. So, so the answer is yes for right now. Do your homework. Yeah, because I, I don't know, like, I, if I'm providing services, like, you know, on the website, we're going to have a URL. Like, anyone can use the services, you know. For example, Craigslist. They're gonna just giving the services. You know, someone might be having the job postings. They don't know where from they're gonna job post the jobs. It might be from Chicago or somewhere else. So how they are like you know like doing that? Like, you know, you to, what I end up doing with a lot of my my clients is I try to figure out what it is they really do because they can't be looking at it from 50,000 feet, you have to get down into the nitty gritty. If they have um, contracts with multiple people, I ask them for copies of those contracts. If they're not, not boilerplate contracts, I want to see them because I need to understand what they've agreed to. And that's going to tell me where to start. And then after I do that, then I go to the state laws, figure out what it is that they think is taxable and what do they think constitutes doing business. And so you have to kind of compare all these different things and figure out what does that state want and how bad are they about going after people. Yeah. What if you're selling using a platform like Amazon or Etsy or something like that? How does that they have a they have a sales and use tax uh, deal. I mean when you sign up, because um, I've looked at it a couple times, they have a they have a contract. And it talks about that in there. And I can't remember now off the top of my head whether it says you got to deal with your own stuff or we deal with it. I can't remember. Okay. But it's in the contract if you have, and I believe that's you have it too. Okay. If you sell in the Amazon, it doesn't come in the business, right? It doesn't require to be registered, you know? You can sell your own product. On Amazon? Yeah. They should, because I know most of my clients that sell on Amazon, they have a contract, because they gave it to me. But it's not a registered company, right? You know, like if I, I have something to sell it, I can just keep it in the Amazon, right? Like, hey, I'm selling this, you know. It should be a registered company. And, and, you know, it may it may be one of those things, you know how how when you, um, you get an upgrade or something, and it says, check this box, it says I've read all this stuff? <laughs> Sometimes it's in there. But a lot of this stuff is a prerogative of the states, so it's, it's driven more by who's getting sued, and that jurisprudence is guiding things instead of just like a national policy. So it's, okay, who got sued this week, and let's let that be our guidance for how we go forward. So obviously they go after the big players like Amazon or Uber. That's, that's a problem with these. Well, they're awesome, but they're going after the little guy too. And as I mentioned, the guy in the one. Well, California is particularly aggressive. Yes. Yeah, 
they have a room full of people that all they do all day is they troll the internet. Yeah. Um, if, if I'm doing some pro bono, you know, design work, and, and that's my specialty, um, it's graphic design, and, and I'm doing pro bono stuff. Can I? Is, is anything packed like a, a write-off? Can I write anything off like that? The hours spent if I'm delivering a product. Well, it depends on how you document. It. Okay. So if it's, I don't know, if they're if you, shirts if, or, if you invoice them, um, um, if you have an agreement that says, you know, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do it for this amount. Plus, I'm going to do this extra because I really like what your your nonprofit does. And if it is a nonprofit, that's the key. They have to be a 501c3, and then they have to give you back a document that says that says you've donated blah 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 blah. Okay, but if you're doing it for just the client, then it's no. just kind of a, that's not okay. Well, I mean, it's if you're bartering, if they're giving you something in return, then that is that can be a taxable transaction. In New Mexico, if um, you do something for somebody and they give you back a bushel of apples, then that's bartering and it's subject to tax. Okay. Cool. Anybody else have fun? Have fun yet? No. <laughs> <laughs> the, the big thing is do your homework, keep your records, um, know your resources. If uh, you run into a problem, it's better to pick up the phone and call somebody. Uh, a lot of times, I mean, I know I do. I do this a lot. People will call our office and they'll say, oh, my God, I have this situation. And, you know, I'll spend an hour and I'll talk to them. And I'll charge them. Um, if they want more than that, you know, then we talk about that. But, you know, there's a lot of folks out there that just want to help people. I mean, you know, we all have to make a living, and but we also want to do something good for our fellow man, and we all have gifts, so, you know, just make sure you reach out. You never know who, who's going to be willing to help you, and give you need that little extra bit of guidance that keeps you out of trouble. Anybody else? How do we get in touch with you? <laughs> My cards are up here. <laughs> <laughs> Questions, and we'll go ahead and wrap up. Thank you all for coming. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.